Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. While Paul has been dealing with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he argues that Christ's death was not an end of its, in itself. It was a necessary step to his resurrection and a new glorified life. With the conclusion that if, as Christ died and was raised, so also we must be, we must die and be raised. And we see this in other passages of scripture that Paul writes, Romans the sixth chapter, in the first seven verses, and how that we are buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Colossians 3 and verse 1, that if we be risen with Christ, we are to seek those things that are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And so... He argues here in our text that those old things are passed away, all things are become new. And we spent an extensive study in looking at the aspect of being in Christ, that it is an approved, acceptable relationship with God. And that in Christ we have no condemnation, Romans 8 and verse 1. We are a new creature in our text, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. We are children of God, Galatians uh, 3 and verse 26. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1 verse 7 and Colossians 1 and verse 14. We have salvation, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10. Yea, we have all spiritual blessings, as Paul puts it in Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And the two verses that tell us how to get into Christ... Romans the sixth chapter verse three and Galatians three and verse twenty seven. Those are the only two passages that tell us how to get into Christ, and both of them state that baptism is the way and that act that takes us from being outside of Christ and puts us into Christ. And thus in Christ we are a new creature. The old things are passed away. That old lifestyle, that old man died on that cross so that we can be raised to walk in newness of life. As a new creature then, we start having new relationships. We recognize that God is new to us. That he is more than just an omnipotent being. That he is truly one who cares and loves and protects us he is a father in heaven. Christ is new that while we recognize the historical aspect of his life and death, that he is far greater than that to us and that he is the only way to God the Father. He is the only mediator between God and man. He is the only Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. That the Holy Spirit likewise is new to us. We have a new relationship to him. But also in this lesson there are some other aspects that, of newness that we have. We have and the universe is new to us. In Isaiah the 50 or the 65th and 66th chapters, Isaiah writes about a new heaven and a new earth that's going to come. We see this in Revelation 21 and verse 1 as well, that I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the earth, first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Isaiah is not dealing with a physical, literal, new heaven and new earth. But Isaiah is dealing with the aspect that there's a new relationship that we have. We're still going to be walking under the same sky. We're still going to see the same stars that are in the universe. 
We're going to be breathing the same air that we breathed before. But from the Christian standpoint, there's a new aspect of the universe. It's, been, it's being seen as it has not been seen before. It really is declaring the very nature of God. In the 19th Psalm in verse 1, the psalmist would say that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We see the very smallest things of this world, the beauties of them. And in those things we're saying here's the handiwork of God. That God is not in that, but we see his work in that. We see the beauties that he sets forth. And so we're seeing God as we look at those things because we see a new we have a new relationship with this universe. It's not just this world that we're living in, but it's setting forth for us the beauties and the glories of God. The fact that God is a unified God. We so have such a, a wonderful aspect that in seeing the world. And seeing that God is. You know, the person in the world, they're now being taught from an atheistic, evolutionist standpoint. This world, well, that's all that there is. And so they examine this world, but they never see God in it. They never see the handiwork of God. They never will make that connection. And they, uh, you can talk about, for example, the fact that the universe is an orderly universe, that there's design that's found in it. To the atheist and evolutionist, there's nothing in that. But the Christian sees something in that because he recognizes that for there to be design, there has to be a designer. And that designer is God. And so he sees all of those things in this world and he recognizes God is. He sees a new universe in that sense. But life itself is new to the Christian. When you look at this world and the people in this world, we start looking at what do they seek after? What are they, what's their purpose in life? What are they really living for? And if you look at some of them, it's very simply eat, drink, and be merry. Just enjoy life in the whatever way that you can find because we're going to be here in a few years and we're going to die and that's the end of it. And so just enjoy what you can while you can is the way in which some have put it. Scriptures say, eat, drink, and be merry. Or in other places, eat and drink, for tomorrow you die. We've just put those together, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Others, well, let me seek after money. If I get a bunch of money, then I'll be happy, I'll be prosperous, and I'll enjoy life. But you know, as they're seeking after money, they never can get enough in order to satisfy themselves. They've always got to get a little bit more. The person who has a dollar in the bank says, if I can only get $10 in the bank, I'll be happy. The person who has $10 in the bank, if I can only get $100 in the bank, I'll be happy. A person who has $100, I know he get $1,000. And on and on it goes. Because they never can really be satisfied with that. But that's what they're seeking after. Others seek for prestige. You know, I want to be well known and well liked. I want to have a name for myself. I want to make a name. Or power. I want all the power. I want people to really, when they see me, they want to, they'll see someone who is in power, who has a lot of influence in this world. 
that I can get things done when I wanted them done. Some people just pleasure. They live a hedonistic type of lifestyle and whatever brings them the greatest pleasure, that's, that's all that matters. And you can go on and on. In Luke the 12th chapter and verse 19, Jesus is giving this parable about a man whose goods brought forth plentiful. And he said to himself, or he said, I said to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That was his attitude. And Christ said, that man is a fool because he has really nothing. He says, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then shall, what shall all these things be that thou hast laid up for thyself? What good is it? In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32, it again uses this same phraseology, that if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow ye die. If this world is all that there is, why are we living the Christian life, he says? If there is not a resurrection from the dead, what advantage does the Christian have over that person in the world? He doesn't have any. He should just simply eat and drink, just seek after the pleasures of this world, just like everyone else. If the dead rise not. But of course, his argument throughout 1 Corinthians 15 is there is a resurrection of the dead. There is something after this life. Christ was raised and became the first fruits of them that rise. We will be raised from the dead and there's something after this world. Matthew 6 chapter and verse 32 and thir or 31 and 32, Jesus says, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall it be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And if we were using the terminology today, instead of using the term Gentiles, we would use, that's what the non-Christian thinks. That's what they're seeking. What we eat, what we drink, what we're going to be clothed with. Don't take th thought for those things. That's not what's important. It's being in a right relationship with God that's important. Or as he says in the very next verse, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. Don't seek after the things of the world. Seek after the things of God. You see, the world seeks after those things. We seek after the things of God because life is new. The Christian can go through all of the troubles and all the trials and temptations, all of the suffering the afflictions that he faces because he looks to something that's better than this life. If you go back and you read all of the problems that Paul endured in St. Corinthians, that here's the shipwrecks, the beatings, and all of these other things that he went through. And then you go back a few chapters in St. Corinthians and he says that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, a moment, worketh for a far more and exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are below, but at the things which are above where Christ sitteth. We're not looking at this world. The Christian looks beyond this world. 
And so as Jesus said in Matthew the 16th chapter verse 24 and 25, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. The one who's seeking after the things of this world, who do, does not recognize that this life is new, is that individual who has not lost his life in Christ. And thus, he's not going to find it. Only that one who loses himself, in other words, his own interest are not what's important to him, it's the interest of God now. He's the one who finds life. He finds purpose. He finds everything in relationship to life itself and what it's supposed to be about. Remember Solomon's conclusion, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is really what man's all about. This is the whole of man. That's the individual who has truly lost his life for my sake, as Christ put it. He is the one who's finding it. And so life is new. But also religious life is new. In 1 John 5 and verse 3, John writes, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. That one who becomes a Christian, his affections are not placed on the things of this world. It's not placed upon man. His affections are in heaven. In Colossians 1 and verse 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. Going into verse 2. We set our affections on spiritual matters, on things of God. His religious life is new. He's no longer looking at self and having the affections of the world, whether it be on self or this world or other individuals, his affections are set in heaven. And Matthew the 6th chapter and verse 20. Jesus tells us to lay not up for yourselves treasures, or to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor a thieves break through nor steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's where our treasure is to be. Where our heart is, that's where our treasure will be. So what? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not on the, thing, the things of this earth. And yet, the world tries to put us in conformity with it by trying to get us to put our affections on money and on goods and on things and on the things of this world. And that can never bring and never will bring true peace and harmony and life and joy and purpose in life. It will only bring heartache. You put your treasure in heaven. That's where our heart is to be. In Philippians, the third chapter in verse 20, Paul says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word conversation in the King James is really not the best translation here. It is dealing with citizenship. And that's the way the American Standard translates it. Or one's citizen life. Because we are a citizen of heaven, that's why he's saying, because we're a citizen of heaven, we should live a certain lifestyle. There's our religious life. 
It's not living like the life of this world, but because we are citizens of heaven, we're living a type of life that exhibits heaven. We are thus, as Peter puts it in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. You see, Peter recognized these things, these fleshly lust, the things of this world, they are at odds with that spiritual life, that religious life that we are to live. And we need to recognize the, fa the fact we are just strangers and pilgrims. We're passing through this world on our way to that spiritual life, that life that would be in heaven. And so, what do we do? We seek those things which are above. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6 and verse 33. We are not to be, as James puts it, James 4 and verse 4, to, the friendship with the world is enmity with God. And so... He says, ye adulterers and adulterers, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. We're not to be the friend of the world. Or John in 1 John 2, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lusts thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so James says, don't be the friend of the world. John says, don't love the world. What is it? We love God first and foremost. This world means nothing to the Christian except as we live and we have the opportunity to glorify God within our life. And so what can they do to us? And that's the attitude that Paul would take there in St. Corinthians. Let all these things I endure, that's light affliction of this world. I'm looking at something far greater. That is heaven's home. But then also man is new. When the world looks at humankind, he just sees man a uh, if he sees an individual out here, he's just one person among the multitude. He might have a greater education than someone else, or he might be able to do something that others cannot do. But just one among many. The Christian sees something else, though. He sees that here is an individual whose soul was made in the very image of God. In Genesis, the first chapter is God creates all of the things of this world. On that sixth day, God created man. It says in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God creates man in his own image. He didn't say that about the animals or the plant life or anything else. But he does say that about man. Made in God's image. In our nation, we are having difficulty within our nation because of, well, we have the Black Lives Matter movement and others saying all lives matter because of the killings of, by the police first and then those killing of, of the police. Not to get into the political ramifications of any of that. But you know, if this world is all that there is, what difference does it make in reality? But the point that we want to all men are important to God. The 
color of hair, if the person has hair or not. You think that matters as far as God is concerned and as far as that individual is concerned? Should we elevate a person who has, well, I have hazel eyes, so let's say hazel eyes, as opposed to someone who has their eyes are brown in color or black in color or I think we ought to elevate the hazel eye people above everyone else. Well, no, there's nothing special there. What about skin color? It doesn't make any difference either. Whether someone is white or black or green or purple or yellow or any other color, it doesn't make any difference. Every person is important to God. It is a precious soul that is there. And God was willing to send his son to die upon the cross for that individual. Now that doesn't mean that that individual is living in, a, in an approved way to God. But it should be important to us that that individual live that way. Because Christ died for him. God loved him enough to send his son to die for, for him. And so that person out on the street corner, you know, that's a precious soul. That unless that individual obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ and lives a faithful life that God wants him to live, that, that precious soul is going to spend an eternity with Satan and his angels. We ought to care about that. You see, that man is new when we take on the viewpoint of Christ because each and every individual is important to God and thus should be important to us. In Hebrews 2 and verse 9 it talks about here's Christ who by the grace of God should taste death for every man. The Jews at the beginning thought you know, that every man taking the gospel to the whole world, that meant the whole Jewish world. Gentiles, they weren't worthy of the gospel. Don't take it to them. And so when Paul in the Acts of the 10th chapter takes the gospel to Cornelius, a Gentile, when he comes back home, here's a Gentile. Why in the world did you go to the Gentiles? And so he has to rehearse this whole situation. Why? Because those Gentile souls are important to God. The Jews at that time thought, no, they're not. They're not worthy of it. They're not worthy of salvation. They considered the Gentiles as dogs. You know, we, we talk about the race problems within our and ra racial issues within our society we have nothing in comparison to what they felt in that day the racial issues between Jew and Gentile was far greater than what we see in our society between whites and blacks or anyone else you could say exactly the same thing back then in relationship to the Greeks and the barbarians. The very fact that they called them barbarians should indicate something to us. You had the Greeks and everyone else was over here a barbarian. They're worthless. That was their thinking. Man is new in relationship to the Christian because where you're talking about a Gentile dog, to the Jews at least, that individual is an individual created in the image of God that Christ died for and that Christ once saved. When we look at our society, that, for example, that prostitute streetwalker out here, Christ died for that individual and wants that individual to be saved, do we? That individual over here who's a murderer, a rapist. Christ died for that individual. 
wants that individual to be saved, wants them to turn their life around. Yes, it, repentance is involved in that, but God wants them to be saved. Do we? Are we willing to be taking the gospel to those individuals? See, the Christian attitude in which all things are new, old things, those old attitudes, they need to be gone for the new attitudes of Christianity. And then, yes, death is new. To people in the world, death is something to be feared. In fact, there have been people through history who refused to even allow the word death to be used in their presence. Do not use that word. Why? Because they feared death. Christian, though, death is new. There's a new attitude toward it. Christian doesn't fear death. Paul, in that great chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, comes down in verse 55 and starts, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he makes a conclusion in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Death? Where's the sting of death to the Christian? It's not. In 2 Corinthians, we've been talking about Paul and his attitude. And in verse, or chapter uh, 4, that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more and exceeding an eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are below, but at the things which are below, above, where Christ sitteth, the right hand of God. And then in chapter 5, in verse 1, he says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. We groan for what? Not for this world, but for death to come so we can pass on to that world eternal house, a heavenly house, a building of God that's not made with hands. Paul, as he's in prison in Rome, going to appear before Caesar Nero, expects to be released from prison, but with the very real knowledge that Caesar could put him to death. And as he writes to the Philippian brethren, he talks about the fact that Christ is going to be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. That's in verse 20. But come down to verse 23, and we see his attitude regarding death when he says, I am in a strait betwixt two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. The idea of depart there is dealing with death. My desire is to die from this physical world. Now he goes on to say, I know that I, I need to live for your sake, but my desire is to die. Why? Because death to the Christian is very simply going from one state to another state. And that other state, that future state, is far better than the state that he's in now. In other words, here you have, you're living a type of lifestyle of doing one thing and living a certain lifestyle, and Paul's lifestyle was that of glorifying or magnifying Christ in his body. 
He was setting forth Christ's glory. For me to live is Christ, verse 21. Thus death is gain. His de desire, and he says what's far greater, is to leave this world to something greater. But that greater can only come to that one who is a Christian. Death is to that individual new in that sense. It's not something to be feared, but it's something that he can endure, he can go through, and he realizes there's something far greater. The word depart in Philippians 1.23 an interesting word, actually, if you study it. It's dealing with, here's uh, the loosing of mooring ropes. That here you build a great ship. You have mooring ropes that hold it into port. And it says, you loose those ropes so that the ship can go into to greater things for what it's intended to do. And that's the idea that Paul is using here. Here, my life in this world, while magnifying Christ, is holding me back. And to die is to go to something far greater. My intended purpose. But that greatness can only come if we are faithful members of the Lord's church. If we, through our obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ by being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins, then raised for this new life, this Christian life that God has set forth, then death will be a blessing. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, writes John in Revelation 14 and verse 13. Or the psalmist would say, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Why? Because they're saints. They've obeyed that gospel to become holy, and they're living that life of holiness. If that's not the lifestyle that you're living, realizing that this world, it has nothing for the Christian, and our affections are set on things above, if you're not have not been baptized into that new life where you become a new creature. Baptism is the only way to get into that, at, that area of being a new creature. Then why not be baptized this morning for the forgiveness of your sins? If you become a Christian, but you haven't continued to set your affections on things above, Maybe you've gone back and you started loving the things of this world and you realize your need this morning to return unto him and to return unto faithfulness. Then why not repent of your sins and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them? So if you need to come this morning to get your life right with Christ so that truly death will be that blessing to you, why not come as we stand and sing the invitation song?